for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we last conducted an oversight hearing of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Farms, and Explosives, or ATF, just over one year ago. Since that time, a few things have changed, and a great many things have stayed the same. Let's begin with what has changed. Last month, the Attorney General signed an ATF final rule clarifying who is, quote, engaged in the business, unquote, of selling firearms, and who must therefore obtain a license to sell firearms and conduct the necessary background checks. This rule implements a change in this definition made by Congress when we passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the first significant piece of gun violence prevention legislation in nearly 30 years. Prior to the passage of the BSCA, a person was, quote, engaged in the business, unquote, of selling firearms if they did so, quote, with the principal objective of livelihood and profit, close quote. But under the new law, a person is engaged in the business of selling firearms if they do so, quote, to predominantly earn a profit, unquote. In finalizing this new rule, ATF has adhered to its directive from Congress and has ensured that ATF regulations are consistent with the definitions we updated through this historic legislation that makes Americans safer. Importantly, the new definition and the new rule ensure that more gun sales, including those at gun shows or through the Internet, include a background check, a life-saving tool that keeps guns out of dangerous hands. These changes are the only significant expansion of the federal background check system since it was established in the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act in 1993. The Department of Justice estimates that there are over 20,000 unlicensed sellers who are taking advantage of ambiguity in the law and who will now have to obtain a license and conduct background checks. Yesterday, in a related hearing, Republicans argued that this new rule is being used to target individuals who are merely selling a gun from their personal collection or who occasionally buy and sell guns as part of a hobby. This is false. The rule, quote, expressly recognizes that individuals who purchase firearms for the enhancement of a personal collection or a legitimate lobby are permitted by the Gun Control Act to occasionally buy and sell firearms for those purposes or occasionally resell to a licensee or to a family member for lawful purposes without the need to obtain a license, close quote. The final rule also states that, quote, Nothing in this rule shall be construed as precluding a person from lawfully acquiring a firearm for self-protection or other lawful personal use, close quote. The law and the rule do not impose any new requirements on those who are merely selling a firearm to a neighbor, a friend, or family member, or those who collect and occasionally sell firearms as part of their hobby. Rather than targeting innocent lobbyist sellers, this rule will permit, I'm sorry, will prevent illegal gun sellers from profiting off gun trafficking. This comes at a critical time, given that the ATF's National Firearms Commerce and Trafficking Assessment revealed that unlicensed gun sales were contributing more and more to the flow of firearms into the black market and, unsurprisingly, becoming a leading source of crime guns. The second new development since we last heard from ATF Director D Dettelbach is that Republicans used their control of the House to enact significant cuts to several critical law enforcement agencies, including the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the ATF. We knew this was coming because Republicans have been forthright in their determination to defund, intimidate, and hamstring the agency so that it can, so that it can no longer effectively do its job and protect Americans from violent crime. Republicans' own messaging documents actually celebrate the 7% cut to the ATF, the law enforcement agency responsible for protecting communities from gun violence, stopping gun trafficking, and ensuring lawful and responsible gun ownership. This brings me to what is still as true today as it was over a year ago when we last conducted an oversight hearing of the ATF. ATF is still the primary federal agency tasked with keeping guns out of the wrong hands, and it is still doing that important work even with the budget cuts forced through by House Republicans. ATF is still providing vital resources that help state and local law enforcement solve crimes and prevent gun violence. ATF is still the only agency in the country that is able to trace gun, crime guns, helping law enforcement determine how a gun came to be owned and used in a violent crime. ATF is also still the only agency that provides local, state, tribal, and federal law enforcement with ballistic imaging analysis, a critical tool that can help solve crime and prevent further gun violence. It provides its assistance at no cost to its law enforcement partners. Despite the significant value that ATF provides to state and local law enforcement, Republicans have defunded the agency, 
and they repeatedly seek to unravel its regulations through litigation, Congressional Review Act resolutions, and frivolous investigations, even when ATF is merely following the law as directed by Congress. Some Republicans have even introduced a bill to abolish the ATF altogether. The majority says that it stands with law enforcement. So why does it seek to abolish the only law enforcement agency with the capability of tracing crime guns? The majority says that they support state and local police. So why do they attempt to starve the agency that provides state and local police officers with so many critical resources for solving crime, including homicides, gun trafficking, and organized crime? And why do they oppose common sense protections, like background checks and red flag laws, favored by state and local police agencies nationwide? The answer lies in another part of ATF's responsibilities, making sure that gun dealers follow the law by conducting background checks, refusing to sell to those who are not allowed to have firearms, and keeping records so that crime guns can be traced. The overwhelming majority of gun sellers have no problem following these laws. But when gun dealers willfully refuse to follow them, it is ATF's responsibility to revoke their license to sell. Republicans' priorities are clear. They would prefer to keep every gun store in the country open, even those that willfully violate the law, rather than to let ATF save lives simply by enforcing the law. And this brings me to the final thing that is still the same since our last oversight hearing. It is still the case that we're losing more than 100 Americans to gun violence every single day. Even without counting suicides, we have already lost more than 6,000 Americans to shootings so far this year. That includes 88 young children, 454 teens, and 30 law enforcement officers who were killed by gunfire just this year. Democrats have put forth a range of solutions to prevent gun violence, to support law enforcement, and to solve crimes. But since they took control of the House, our Republican colleagues have not advanced a single bill that would make Americans safer from gun violence. Instead, they have continued to push for unfettered access to assault weapons, concealable rifles, and ghost guns, and to abolish the very agency tasked with preventing gun crimes. As Republicans continue to seek freedom from gun regulations, we will continue to see communities free from gun violence. Director Dettelbach, thank you for appearing here today to talk about the important work that the ATF does to keep Americans safe. I look forward to your testimony, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back 1.4 billion in 2022, 1.6 billion in 2023, 1.75 billion in 2024. Hardly a cut to their budget. We'll begin the hearing uh, with opening statement. Chair recognizes himself. Government's not supposed to change the rules without a vote of Congress. Executive branch executes the laws. The legislative branch passes the laws. But when you bypass that format, which is exactly what the ATF has done, you get all kinds of bad things. First, it was the pistol brace rule. November 26, 2012, the ATF told the inventor of the pistol brace, quote, he would not be subject to the National Firearms Act. But last year, they changed the rule after 12 years. Changed the rule. The rule, by the way, the pistol brace was, was, was put together to help disabled veterans be able to shoot, be able to practice and shoot at the range. Now, with the rule change, you don't turn it in, get rid of it, you become a felon. Then it was a policy change that the ATF enacted. The ATF now says, if a federal firearms licensee makes a mistake on the form, even if it's a clerical mistake, well, that now equals a, quote, willful falsifying of records, and they could lose their license. In fact, 157 FFLs lost their license last year in this gotcha game that the ATF is playing with people who are in the business of selling firearms. And the pressure to deal with what the ATF comes out and finds you made some mistake on a form Many people are just voluntarily giving up their FFL. 24 in 2021, 69 in 2022, 80 people last year gave up their license versus dealing with the hassle from the agency that's supposed to help them comply, not put them out of business. And finally, there's the new definition of who actually needs a federal firearms license. Since 1968, the definition said it had to be your principal livelihood principal livelihood in the business of selling firearms. 
<coughs> you needed that. If you were doing that, you needed an FFL. But this past Monday, new definition was put in place. It said if you're earning a profit, ATF doesn't be able to, can't really define what that means. You sell one gun to your cousin, made $10, made $50 on the sale of a gun, two guns to someone, 10 guns. In fact, they couldn't even tell how, tell the court how it works, this new definition. When you make up the rules as you go, bad things happen. You lose your livelihood for a clerical error. You become a felon for having a pistol brace they told you was legal for 12 years, and you might even get shot. That's what happened to Brian Malinowski just two months ago. We have Brian's widow with us today. She was here with us yesterday, heard some powerful testimony from U.S. Attorney Bud Cummings, who represents the Malinowski family. In fact, I'm going to read from Mr. Cummings' testimony that he gave in this room yesterday. It's legal to buy, trade, and sell guns without a federal firearms license if you are a collector or hobbyist. But at some point, the ATF decided that Brian Malinowski had crossed a murky line, and he was no longer a hobbyist. Because of that, ATF concluded he was required to purchase a $200 federal firearms license before he sold any more guns. I call it murky because there is no bright line test. It's truly subjective. But one thing seems certain, Brian Malinowski received no warning. His family, his friends, his work colleagues would all guarantee you he loved his career and he would have never knowingly jeopardized it over a weekend hobby. His real job, his main job, the only job, was he ran the Bill and Hillary, <coughs> Hillary Clinton Airport in Little Rock, Arkansas, highest paid official in the municipal government, made $260,000 a year. But on March 19th, at 6.01 a.m., over one hour before sunup, 10 carloads of ATF agents and Little Rock Police Department officers came to the Malinowski home to execute their search warrant. Not an arrest warrant, search warrant. At 6.02.46 a.m., ATF agents in full SWAT gear approached the front door. They had a piece of tape ready to cover the camera lens of the doorbell camera which they did. Next, Mrs. Malinowski heard only a loud crash as her front door caved in. Her husband, Brian, woke up to the sound of the crash, found a pistol, loaded a magazine, and left the bedroom to investigate. Brian warned his wife to stay behind in the bedroom, but Mayor stubbornly followed him down the hallway. ATF apparently killed electricity to the home. The front room was usually well lit at night, but Mrs. Malinowski saw only darkness as she peered down towards the front entryway. She could only see shadowy outlines of presumed home invaders standing in her front hallway. That's what Brian saw too. Brian fired a few shots at the intruder's feet to drive them back out of the front door. The ATF shot Brian in the head. His wife was standing inches away from him. A mere 57 seconds. 57 seconds elapsed from the time agents covered the doorbell camera until gunshots erupted and Brian was fatally wounded. 6.02.46 to 6.03.43. Agents immediately dragged Mrs. Malinowski into the front yard. She was barefoot, wearing minimal night clothing, and the temperature was 34 degrees. They locked her in the back seat of a car and detained her there for four hours, refusing her many requests to check on her husband, her husband she had just seen shot, wouldn't allow her to get close or even use the neighbor's bathroom. Even though policies have been in place at both the ATF and the Little Rock Police Department for the past three years, requiring the use of body-worn cameras when executing any search warrant, the Department of Justice tells us that no body cameras were used. If this isn't the weaponization of government, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. Mr. Dettelbach, we're going to have questions about this and a host of other things the ATF has done under your watch. I, a host of other things. We appreciate you being here today. We appreciate you taking our questions, but there's going to be tough questions from folks on our side. And we have a video I'd like to show, which just so it's a minute and a half, but it first shows ATF agents assembling in the Walmart parking lot 
a week before March 19th when they were going to execute this search warrant. Again, pre-dawn hours a week before, but decided not to because they realized Mr. Malinowski wasn't home. And then it shows what happened a week later as they approached the Malinowski home. So let's run the video. Chair now recognizes the ranking member. The gentleman from North Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I'd yield to you. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Trusty, 17 years at the Department of Justice. Did the raid on Mar a Lago follow normal process? I don't believe so. You know who agrees with you? The Assistant FBI Director of the Washington Field Office, because we deposed it. And I just want to walk you through and say if, the, if what you see, uh, saw squares with what Mr. D'Antuano testified to in a deposition in front of the committee. The Miami field office did not conduct the search. The folks from Washington who came down and did the search. Is that unusual? I would think so. You'd normally have at least some local component. The department did not assign a U.S. attorney to head up the investigation. They ran it out of the field office. They ran it out of Washington, D.C. Is that unusual? Well, I'm not sure it's unusual for DOJ attorneys to kind of assume authority in a vacuum. So, you know, my understanding is Jay Bratt was involved from day one and that that continued through the search warrant, obviously. Right, but no normally wouldn't a, wouldn't a U.S. attorney be assigned to it in most cases? Yeah, and eventually they would show up for court, but I don't think at that part of the process they were an active partner. Did the FBI seek consent before they conducted the research? Or uh, the search. No, actually, the last thing that President Trump said when he allowed FBI agents in Mar-a-Lago in June was, anything you need, let me know. The only communication that came from DOJ after that was a request to put a padlock on the door where they knew the boxes were. And then the next thing we know, which, two which months... Which the president complied which with. Which he did immediately. And two months later, there's a search warrant. And then did the uh, FBI wait when they got on premise, had it secured, did they wait for President Trump's legal team to be there and accompany them on the search? They, there were requests by representatives of President Trump to be you know, in the vicinity of the search. Those were denied. That is a right of law enforcement. They don't have to. But for a case of this historical precedence, consistent with my earlier remarks, some transparency, some openness would have been probably a valuable moment lost here. Yeah, no, no kidding. Uh, talk to me about, in your testimony, um, Two other things. You, you mentioned the, the, the 14th Amendment. I mean, this, this to me struck me as just absolutely craziness, that they're going to go to state courts and try to keep the president off the ballot. Tell me your thoughts on this, this crazy concept. Well, you know, the Supreme Court unanimously agreed to, to end the nonsense of the disqualification litigation, but I, they never really reached the due process, which would have been a... a, a a hornet's nest of going state by state and saying, how did they conduct these expedited trials? The, the fact that always grabbed me, and maybe this goes back to having a bad sense of humor, was in Colorado, they literally put a sociologist on the witness stand to say, when President Trump said, go peaceful and patriotically, I know from my Ouija board or whatever else he consults, that he really means be violent and attack the cops. Yeah. I mean, that was considered admissible information in a hearing designed to take a presidential candidate off of a ballot. So 
I kind of wanted the Supreme Court to get the due process and, yeah. and join me in laughing at that, yeah. no, but kidding. they never got there. Yeah, what he said, I've concluded, means exactly the opposite, and the court accepted that as evidence. Thank goodness the Supreme Court said nine to zero. This is crazy. I want to read you one other thing from your, your testament, which I just found amazing, and you briefly touched on it earlier. You said, if the pre this is a grand jury situation, in the grand jury, the prosecution said to uh, Mr. Parlatori, if the president is being so cooperative, why won't he waive his attorney-client privilege? The fact that they asked that question in a grand, I mean, is, again, maybe as crazy as the whole 14th Amendment argument. Yeah, I mean, again, nothing I'd seen in 35 years, and it was a, uh, an over-aggressive moment of asking the grand jury to draw a negative inference right. from a lawful invocation of attorney-client privilege. That's just black letter unethical for a prosecutor to do. Yeah, scary, scary stuff that we see going on, all to go after their political opponent, and we could, we could go on with example after example. Um, I mean the one before where the dangling the judgeship in front of a lawyer representing when you got Jay Bratt and the DOJ there is just, I mean, I, again, we could, we could go on and on. I want to thank you both for, for testifying and would yield back.